works. <laughs> right. Oh, that's painful. <laughs> There's an interesting point to this. Um, it's all about trust and the way that people believe things. And if something looks like it's right, people will assume that it is right. And it's always an interesting security principle that lots of people forget. And a lot of the stuff about doing threat analysis is the way you think about things and a questioning mind and the uh, willingness to get your hands dirty, look at things from other ways, etc., etc. So, who am I? Uh, I'm an ordinary mortal. I used to be a, a CASSP. Uh, so, I used to work in a security, security engineering uh, department of a, a US uh, company. Uh, so, I know way too much about hacking devices that measure things. Uh, and uh, I've, I've come up against an awful lot of people who know that the real world out there is harmless and that web front ends are no problem. Uh, and that clouds, uh, I had a guy from Microsoft who told me that replication was a perfectly good substitute for backups. Yeah, I wasn't convinced myself. I've always wanted a t-shirt that says there's no way that would ever happen. Because that's what everyone always says. Whenever you say have you thought about, they'll say, there's no way that would ever happen. And they keep saying that right up until the moment that it actually does happen. And I've also interviewed loads of guys from uh, companies like Sony, who when something goes wrong, Sony get rid of people and they turn up on the job market. And so you interview them and you say, so, um, did you have anything to do with the problems that Sony had, and you then ask which one of the various problems that they've had, uh, and they say, oh no, 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 that wasn't me. And you say, so why are you on the job market then? Yeah. So, your takeaway is that. I don't have any t-shirts, I've thought of doing t-shirts. So, what we're going to do, uh, I'm a straightforward guy, so we're going to do straightforward stuff. Uh, there's nothing scary or hard to understand, although given the people we've got, um, then uh, I don't think I need to uh, convince you about that. It doesn't require a brain the size of the planet, and you don't need an expensive consultant. Well, not at first, anyway. By the way, feel free to contradict me if you ask that. <laughs> so, I'll do some background very quickly. So what is threat analysis? When do you do it? How do you do it? Oh! <laughs> Whoa! Yeah, uh, there are some people, I'm not going to mention any names, but there are all sorts of organisations where these last two things are actually on their agenda for when you do threat analysis. They really aren't interested in anyone ever knowing what the results of the analysis were, and they really, really, really don't want to do it again. They want to do it, say that they did it, and then hide it, push it away, and never do it again. So, I'll replace that with some real things. So, how do you turn the results into actions? And how do you make sure that you do it again? And a lot of that is by not uh, swamping people with process. I'm not a big process person. So, what's a threat? Well, there's also some classic definitions of threats. Uh, so, anything that leads to any sort of problem with your service, your data, etc, etc, etc. But you should always put an XKCD slide in. And so here's a threat. This is the, the well-known spanner attack, which is incredibly useful for getting into laptops. Um, best bit about it is you don't actually really need the spanner. It can be a virtual spanner, and it's almost as effective as the real spanner. Uh, and five dollars seems like quite a lot. I can buy all sorts of things for a lot less than that that will get a password out of most people. So that's what a threat is. So we're talking about alteration, interruption or loss. Uh, and in case we did have any people here who didn't already know, I've got some uh, things here where we've got interesting definitions of them. 
The one for loss is interesting because everyone always thinks that loss, they put very, very tight boundaries on it. Uh, and so they always think, well, it's going to be names and passwords, it's going to be data, etc., etc. But actually, it's things like reputation. So, um, Talk Talk is a, an interesting example of a company that lost an awful lot of reputation uh, because not only were they hacked, they were hacked repeatedly, um, and they didn't seem to do very much about it. They didn't seem to um, take very much advice, etc., etc. Uh, then there's users. Users stop using your service. That's worse than a loss of reputation because if no one uses your service, things are on the wrong kind of slope. And then you've got money, where it's another type of loss that particularly management don't like. Um, one of the ways that uh, you'll see, I recommend talking about um, the, the sort of risk and the damage that uh, you get is to talk about it in real money. Uh, it actually boils down to the integrity of the, the data, uh, the availability of your service, of the data, of the resource, whatever you're talking about. And loss comes down to this thing where you want, you didn't want the stuff to go out and be read by everyone, etc., etc. So I'll call it confidentiality. And that gives you the uh, beautifully named CIA triangle, which has nothing to do with the Central Intelligence Agency. Uh, and you can make all sorts of wonderfully glib things about a triangle is only strong if you have three parts. Because everyone always forgets uh, the availability part. They remember the confidentiality because that's nice and coding and uh, you're, you're doing encryption and so on. They remember integrity because there you've actually got data loss or service loss or something. Um, and then availability, the thing where you say, well, actually, I'd like uh, my uh, website to be there all the time is the bit that people forget. Uh, and there's some pedants who say actually there's more than three things because there's privacy which is difficult to squeeze into CIRA and there's access control which is similar. So it's actually a five-sided triangle. You could probably argue several more sides. So it's a polygon. Uh, yes. I'm sure you know all these definitions. Um, a threat is a guy with a spanner who's going to extract your password from you. An attack is the guy with the spanner actually extracting the password from you. Vulnerability is you not wanting to get hit by the spanner uh, repeatedly until you tell him the password. Uh, an exploit, uh, that's him actually hitting you with the spanner repeatedly. And risk, um, yeah, he's definitely going to hit you and it's going to hurt. And that's what risk is. So, threat analysis. If you look up threat analysis on Google, you get a very interesting result, which is not what we're talking about at all. This is the standard thing you get back from threat analysis if you look it up on Google. And it's all to do with terrorism and things. It's nothing to do with IT or cyber or any of those things. So, let's put it in context. Um, knowledge of stuff about stuff is matched against things that might happen to it. So, the sort of questions you need to be thinking about if you're going to do threat analysis are for your insert whatever it is here, so service resource, data, device, etc. I'm going to go slightly outside the OWASP remit because uh, in real security it's very difficult to say, no, 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 I'm only going to look at the security of just this bit, and that bit that's outside, well, we really don't care about that, and we'll see later on why that doesn't work. So, yeah, you want to think about vulnerabilities, and you want to think about attacks, and you need to find people who understand them. So, who are the best people who know about vulnerabilities and attacks on things? Well, generally... In my experience, the people who know the best things are not the project managers. Because the project managers are always the people that you get faced with when you try and do threat analysis. Uh, and actually what you want is exactly the opposite of the project managers. You want the people who actually specify, design, develop, write, test, 
quality control, etc., etc. They know the most about it, uh, but they they lack one thing, and that one thing is not a special weapon that shoots the project manager. It's a special weapon of a different kind. It's a question. And the question you ask them is, how would you mess up the stuff you're working on? And there's lots of ways you can say it. How would you edit the data? How would you stop it working? How would you steal the data? Um, how would you uh, stop your website uh, from recovering if something goes wrong? Etc. Etc. But yeah, basically, how would you wreck it? It's a great enabling question. What's really good is that you can use that to very quickly sort out project management disguised as real uh, engineers and the real coders, designers, etc. etc. Because a project manager, when you say, how would you wreck it? They don't really have any good answers. They don't want to wreck it. They're not interested in that. Whereas your engineer would say, well, where do I start? So. We're going to do some threat analysis. We need something to put it in. We need structure. So just arming people with questions is only part of the solution. What you need is a process or a structure to put all those answers into something useful. And uh, the obvious thing at this point is, has anyone done such a structure? Because if they haven't, then we can definitely make one. So here's one. Um, Microsoft Security Development Lifecycle started out just uh, for software. Uh, Microsoft introduced this sort of thinking when um, they had um, operating systems where the lifetime, sorry, not lifetime, the uptime that they were expecting for the operating systems was measured in high tens of minutes and low hours. And they realized that there was something wrong when they themselves, their expectation of their software was less than perfect. Um, and as for the security of this stuff that wasn't up very long, actually the security was hugely improved by the fact that it didn't stay up for very long. So, over time it's evolved. There's loads of free resources, tools, etc. etc. that you can get from Microsoft. It's well evolved from the original. It's very detailed and it's got lots of mature thinking. Microsoft have put huge amounts of effort into it. It's great uh, for big projects uh, where you can make a serious investment of time, people, and that interesting thing that we talked about before that you don't want to lose lots of. It's not so good for things that aren't really very software -y. So if you do physical security, then kind of goes weird. It's no good at all for that anti-terrorism thing that we had as the definition of uh, threat analysis. It's not so good on hardware, although Microsoft do do hardware. Uh, and it really starts to struggle for, <coughs> I was going to say one man and dog projects, but it's one person and dog projects. And it's got a workflow, a nice, simple, straightforward workflow. I love nice, complicated, um, heavy, etc., uh, etc., et where um, it needs a team of people and you've got to understand it in depth, etc., etc. Um, and um, yeah, unless you're a big team and etc., you run. So let's look at something else. Let's look at the opposite side of things. Uh, so we've looked at what a software company <coughs> does. Um, let's look at what a telco organization does. So Etsy. Etsy is a, an interesting uh, standards organization because uh, it's very telecom focused but it's trying <coughs> to move out into other areas. And one of the really unfortunate things about Etsy is that its headquarters are at the top of a mountain in the south of France, just to the west of Nice. So it's a dreadful location. You do not want to go there. It's got views across the Mediterranean, it's got pine trees, it's, it's, it's not glorious. You do not want to go there. Definitely not. It's a great place. Uh, so, this is telco people thinking about how you do threat analysis. Again, there's lots of free resources. Highly evolved, it's detailed, it's got mature thinking. In fact, it's got masses of mature thinking. There's a gorgeous 
a quote on Reddit where uh, someone says, <coughs> and you know what Reddit's like, uh, they say, so, um, let's see, TVRA, how does this compare to Microsoft SDLC? And one of the SDLC devs replies, and he says, hmm, he says, it's a bit of a subset, he says, uh, not sure they knew what they were talking about. And yeah, a lot of this reads the same as the previous one. That's got a workflow. This one's got two less things, but it's starting to get interesting at the end. Because you've got cost-benefit analysis, because this is from a telco, and it's got feedback. It's also got some interesting stuff right at the very beginning. Home, there's the OWASP, what's now called Application Threat Model. OWASP are very good at changing the name of things. The tools keep changing their names. Uh, the um, procedures and things keep changing their names. Uh, and this one is very interesting uh, because it, it's got caveats and so on in it. So like it says, most of the time the threat model includes all of that. Um, and it, it does actually have an interesting uh, approach to the way that it does things. Now it's got a workflow. It says threat model should be part of the SDLC from Microsoft. And they have a motto. Now none of the other ways of doing threat analysis have a motto. The uh, OWASP motto is threat modeling. The sooner the better, but never too late. And that's really good. Now that is a workflow that says, don't hang about till the end, and everyone always does. Particularly project managers, they say, what's the last possible time you can actually do this threat analysis? And then it happens after that. Um, what's really interesting about the uh, OWASP stuff is it has stuff that is not in TVRA or SDLC. It's got this thing. Did we do a good enough job? And it says, check, check what your output was. Incredibly useful. So, I have an incompleteness theory. Uh, there's never a complete perfect solution. So, I've shown you three possible solutions. Uh, the second law of thermodynamics means that you never are going to have that complete perfect solution. Uh, you always get several incomplete things. Uh, most of your solutions, and I'm cynical about this, will be tedious and complex. And there's no way that SDLC or TVRA is complex or tedious. Uh, and most of the solutions will be hated by your boss's boss. Your boss's boss hates all this threat analysis. Uh, and yes, you can see a previous version of this had an incredibly vital piece of information to where that missing piece of the puzzle was. Of course, the last line is the most important bit about any incompleteness theorem. Okay, just good enough. Uh, I'm sure you all remember what that fourth point of uh, OWASP's ATM workflow was. You're always supposed to ask questions about things as you go along so you can check that people were actually listening. Uh, and the question is, was it any of these things? No, it's, did we do a good enough job? So, uh, yes, you can write a good enough criterion, and it's one where there's a plan to check the quality, feasibility, progress, and it happens. One of the interesting things about threat analysis is that it's very often a series of meetings that never quite happen. Uh, so you've got the threat analysis meeting itself, You've then got the follow-up meetings, etc., uh, etc. Et uh, those are very difficult to make happen. It needs a very tenacious person uh, to do things. So I'm a month and a bit early, but uh, here's the thing on uh, what does uh, just good enough in terms of threat analysis look like? Uh, is Microsoft's way of doing things just good enough? Well, probably not. Uh, TVRA is very interesting. Uh, OWASP ATM. But remember, you've got to do some of the bits of SDLC as well. 
Uh, that's probably interesting. Uh, none of the above is what you always get on a, a voting form. Uh, and finally, we've got the, an, an interesting one, there's something else. And I'm in the something else camp when I've got something that's that one person dog project. So, keep it really simple. So here's something I made up. Um, it's a spreadsheet. This is the spreadsheet in its entirety. Um, it's very interesting to compare this with the sort of spreadsheet that you can get from Etsy for TVRA. That is a marvelous piece of spreadsheetism. And the latter parts of the Etsy TVRA spreadsheet have masses of embedded formulas so that it can do interesting things with all the numbers that you put in and it gives you all these beautiful um, modeling um, views of the data that you've put in. Really, really nice. But slightly more complicated than what we've got here. The A columns, it's got a simple rating system. It goes from one to four. There is no zero. Uh, and there's one row a threat. So when you find a threat, you put it on a row and fill in the things to the right. No one ever thinks about preparation for these things. They just book a meeting and that's it. Uh, first one's obvious. The second one, that's where you apply that test as to whether it's a project manager or a real <coughs> coder. Uh, the third one, try to prevent the owner's boss from being in the room. People's behaviour changes. It's really strange. Uh, you put someone there in a room and they're quite happy to talk to you. When their boss is there, the answers they give suddenly change. It's nice to be able to see the spreadsheet. And this one's really difficult. These days, it's almost impossible to have a meeting without someone looking at their mobile phone, or texting, or reading their emails. Here's those eight columns. Asset, threat, vulnerability, damage, or the impact of whatever happens, the likelihood, the risk, the mitigation, and the action. So the asset is what are you protecting? People get really confused about what they're protecting. Is it your data? Is it your code? Is it your servers? Your network? Is it your patents? Is it your secret source? Is it your girlfriend's telephone number? Any of those things. What's the thing that you're actually protecting? Is it your reputation? Is it the service? Have you partitioned things sensibly? Uh, you rate each of the parts that we've got uh, between one and four, where one is trivial and four is this is really bad, and you ignore the ones and twos. You then ask each expert for, most, for each of the most important parts that you found, so that's the threes and fours, the threes and the fours, and you say, how do you stop it, break it, steal it, etc., etc.? And in the unlikely case that they can think of a way of doing something bad to the system they've helped design, implement, specify, etc., etc., you then are a row to the spreadsheet. So that's one of your threats. And even more unlikely, if they can think of other ways of doing things, you add more rows. So, what's the threat? There's all sorts of uh, things that people never think of. Uh, so there's a few. Uh, insiders. There's never any chance of an attack by insiders. There's no way that uh, the careful uh, vetting and so on of people who go into most companies uh, is going to let a bad guy in. Equally, outsiders. There ought to be someone who's checking all these outsiders. I mean, we ought to look at everyone else, make sure that they're all okay. End of life failure. Everyone always thinks uh, about what's going to happen in five years' time, in ten years' time, etc., etc. 
I've got masses of equipment at home that's brilliant uh, long after the guarantee period has happened. Some equipment. The odd bit here and there. That's it. And then lack of monitoring and lack of, lack of oversight. Yeah. And then there's real threats for things where someone's actually going to try and steal um, the database. There are no wrong answers here. Consider everything. And as I said, you consider the threat, say what the threat is, and ignore the ones and the twos. Vulnerability. What makes this possible? Um, the things that people always forget are interesting things like the wrong configuration, the physical location, uh, incomplete processes, um, backups, uh, bugs, the OWASP top 10. Everyone always talks about the OWASP top 10, but when you say, okay, so have you ever considered any of the uh, things mentioned in the OWASP top 10? They say, no, but I do know what the OWASP top 10 is. Then they've got no time. And there was definitely no time for testing. And if they did do some testing, they outsourced it and someone else did that. We sent it away to India and India looked at it. Uh, people will try and say vulnerabilities, that will never happen. The person to listen to throughout all of this is the person who specified design, helped write, help test, etc, cetera, etc, cetera, that expert again, because they probably know. They probably know all of this anyway. They know what the vulnerabilities are. Damage. What's the impact of uh, things going wrong? Loss of data, loss of service, loss of... Blah, 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 blah. But it gets more interesting as we go along. So loss of reputation, loss of income, loss of staff, and loss of bonuses. Now, loss of bonuses is interesting uh, because uh, does anyone want to make something that's naff? I've been in companies where most of the senior management chain was entirely devoted to making something that was naff. That was business as usual. That was what they did. Uh, so the technique that I've developed over time is that you say that a senior manager, the more senior the better, should have any of the losses that are likely to happen removed from their bonus pool. So if you say, uh, this is going to cost us something like a million dollars, and you say, so I think that the best way to ensure that something actually good happens is that the CEO, a million pounds should be removed from their bonus pool, and so uh, that way it will encourage them to actually think about it and do something. When you turn stuff into real money, <coughs> it changes people's view. Damage suddenly becomes real when you put money onto it. Likelihood. There was a beautiful example of the way that people think about the likelihood of things a few years ago. Uh, the trains from Ipswich into London. Uh, a train going into London ripped down the overhead wires and uh, there was mayhem. And the head of the rail company came on and on the television he said that this was a once in a hundred year event and that he was very sorry, but sometimes these things happened. The following day, another train ripped down the cables that they'd used to replace the ones that the first train pulled down. And the guy from the railway company went on the television and he said, well, he said, sometimes once in a hundred year events happen twice. Guess what happened on the third day? On the third day, another train ripped down all of the replacement cables that they'd replaced the first time and the second time, and they were ripped down again. This time, the guy from the railway company refused to go on the television. There was no way he was going to say, sometimes a one in a hundred year event happens three times in a row. So we're back to, there's no way that would ever happen. You'll now remember that story. You'll remember there's no way that would ever happen. Risk. Risk is easy. It's a calculation. You already know what the damage is likely to be. Remember, that's a number. 
a number of money. It's the money that you're going to get the CEO to take out of their bonus pool and we multiply it by the likelihood that we've got. Now the likelihood is interesting because um, the result of this is going to be a number that's between 1 and 16 times the amount of money in the pot, which is an awful lot of money. What you need to do when you're thinking about mitigations, curing things, etc., etc., is to try and reduce both of these. And an eager CEO who wants his bonus is a very good way of making sure that you are motivated to reduce them. You've got to think about low, low damage things that happen frequently, as well as high damage things that happen every few years. And double figures are very scary. If you've got high damage, and it's happening frequently, like pulling down overhead cables with trains, then you need to really worry about them. Mitigation. Mitigation is where we've crossed the peak, and we're down on the interesting side, because you're going to think about how you can minimize that damage. You're going to think how you can protect your asset. You're going to think about how you can reduce the likelihood. And this is where brainstorming is good. It's always interesting in brainstorming um, if a project manager has managed to sneak through all of the vetting so far, because this is where things start to go wrong, because they really struggle trying to think of good mitigations. And one of the really interesting danger words that you have is when they say, oh, we need to talk to such and such. What you need to do is get such and such in because they are the real expert. And actually, it's best to restart. Danger signs in mitigation. No one can come up with any mitigations. That's where you ask if you've got the real experts in the room. You then ask them who might know about fixing it. Or alternatively, you get lots and lots of mitigations, and then more, and then more. That's interesting, because when you get that, what it means is that there's an interesting design methodology that they've got. The specifications, the design, the implementation, the testing, whatever, might be this interesting word here. Uh, if you do get those, you say to them, maybe you ought to think about all these things and come back to me when we don't get humongous numbers of mitigations. Following it up. You need to define one or two things. Time scale, what the action is, who's responsible for it, how you're going to track it, and regular progress monitoring. You need penalties for late or non-completion. And you need to involve a senior manager. So all of those people who avoided the meeting that you had, those are the people, your pool of people that you use to tie down to this. Final sign-off and date must be at a very senior level and directly informed. This is not a blind signature where you give someone a piece of paper saying, can you sign this, please? No, 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 they've got to be involved. You've got to revisit things. So this is all back to that thing that we had that was the beautiful bit about the OWASP ATM, and that was this thing that said, at the very end, see what you've done, make sure that you've actually made progress, that your quality of stuff, did you do stuff that was good? You really do follow it up. Actions, you really, really do follow these things up. You revisit, assess them after a suitable time period. You escalate. You keep that spreadsheet, because that spreadsheet is incredibly valuable. It's a valuable asset itself. I was trying to steal something uh, from a set of people who are doing web development. If they'd done threat analysis, one of the things I'd be really interested in would be their threat analysis, because it tells me everything about their project and how to get in there. Steal interesting assets, that girlfriend's telephone number, for instance. Some examples. So here's our first example. So this is where you have to do something. So, so what do you think the asset is here? Wheels. 
It's just avoiding saying the bike. Let's just go okay. bike. <laughs> it's common. not the bike. No. <laughs> there are two oh, things. First of all, a decent yeah, chain, nice. decent chain like that. Um, so you're talking uh, really sophisticated stainless steel, uh, or even any of the roller stuff, uh, or even the titanium stuff, which is really, really unobtainium. Uh, those can probably easily outclass the cost of the, the bike. Uh, but actually, that's not the real asset that you've got here at all. We are not looking here uh, at the bike. The bike is window dressing. It's, uh, it's the icon uh, on the, uh, the website. If we're thinking about stuff in terms of a web application, then we are in the role of the guy who runs the supermarket. Uh, and so the asset that he's bothered about is the pillar. Because why is the pillar there? The pillar's there to stop ram raiding. So actually, uh, anything that happens to that pillar, anything that stops it from being effective, anything that uh, makes it so that uh, it's less effective, anything that's going to damage it, any of those things are things that are affecting the asset. And all you see here, the bicycle and the chain, and the fact that people are always using that to lean up against it, etc., etc., they're all potentially damaging or weakening the effectiveness of your asset, because your asset is the thing that's stopping someone driving the transit van into the front of your store. Usually, you do it so that you can get to the back of ATMs. And those aren't the OWASP ATMs, they're real money dispensing ATMs. So, that's what the threat is. The threat is that someone's going to do that. The vulnerability is the fact you're going to let people in at the front of your store. Damage. The damage could be huge. If you have a RAM raid on your shop, the time it takes you to recover from it is quite high. You've got an awful lot of nasty stuff has happened at the entrance to your store. Most supermarkets don't have a spare entrance. Very interesting, given the fact that RAM raiding is a classic way of people getting at supermarkets. Uh, and the two places they go to are the front door so they can get in, grab stuff, or they go to where the ATMs are. The ATMs are usually in a reasonably critical corner of the store. Likelihood. Likelihood is very tricky in this case. It depends on how desperate the people in the immediate location are, or how easy it is uh, to get there. So what's the communications like? Are there motorways outside your store? Around Ipswich, the A14 being what it is, I'd have thought the likelihood of anyone doing mass RAM raiding was quite low. What's the risk? The risk is the damage times the likelihood, but you remember that. Uh, mitigations. What can we do as mitigations for uh, stopping people from RAM raiding our shop? One of the things you can do is make the pillars look stronger and less like bicycle supports. So if they look weak, um, and ineffective and the sort of thing that ooh, maybe you could drive through them, uh, then they're not doing their job. What's our action? Our action is that we need to think about all of these things and not assume uh, that the bicycle is the asset. Here's a harder one. So what's the asset this time? So what do you notice about the picture? We've got a gate, security gate. We've got two parallel roads, and we've got a road to join them. And then it's obviously winter of some form, uh, and yet there's a few tracks around there. The thing about this is, how long has this been going on? which is the question no one has ever asked me. They always think that this is obviously something that's been going on for a long while and that people have been habitually going around this gate for a long, long time. Well, actually, if they had been, then the, there would be lots more dirt on here. These would be much, much more built into the environment. And someone would have gone straight across. So this is something where something has changed. So there's been a change here. And so you can look at this and you can say, hmm, my asset is not the gate. There's obviously something that has changed. 
that means that maybe the gate has failed. Maybe the gate used to work, but recently, like the last few days, maybe even today, the gate has failed and people are driving around it, but it doesn't normally fail. For some reason, the guy who's normally stood there isn't operating it. So once again, the obvious thing you think about is not necessarily what's going on. And when you look at a real system, it's incredibly easy to be distracted by something that appears to be the thing that is obviously the thing that's going on. Like the blur thing at the beginning. I've got a slide there that says, please adjust your projector so that it's nice and sharp. And it's a way of wasting your time, messing about with the projector, etc., etc. Because you trust the slide. The slide must obviously be something to do with getting it right. And it isn't. It's malicious. Same thing here. There's a lot more to this picture than meets the eye. Another one. So what do we think the asset might be in this case? We've got a fragment of a web page. We've got some of the uh, HTML from the page. And we've got the user input into the box. Any, any guesses as to what the asset that is at risk here might be? Yeah, accounts is quite cool, and uh, the customer ID, we're going to get that, and uh, yes, it's the database. So this is a thing where, very obviously, the threat is that someone's going to go to your database. More importantly, they're going to get um, a nice list of uh, all the customer IDs, etc., etc. And again, you can do the same thinking about this. So, eight columns, quick, simple, simple numbers, but it grabs things and it captures things without a huge amount of effort. Because as soon as you start putting process and effort and complexity into things, people lose the will to live and they become project managers. Your takeaway? You can get the spreadsheet from uh, my, uh, my blog. Uh, you're never ever going to remember security tourists until you know that it's a palindrome. Curiously enough, for reasons I cannot understand, this was incredibly easy to register. No one else had used it. <sighs> it's a strange world. Thank you. And uh, in case you'd forgotten, here's that. Uh, <laughs> Projector wrecking uh, test. Thank you. Can I ask you a question? Yes, of course you can. The likelihood scores were above one. Yes. It's intentional attribute to make the numbers terrifying. Yes. Okay. <laughs> also, it's a, an abstraction. Yeah, so so the, the numbers are uh, the one is there. Uh, two is and you multiply it by real money. Two is mildly concerning. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. Three, and four, yes, yeah. Three <laughs> and four are nice big numbers. Yes, a, a scale of minus two to plus two or something. Or percentages. Yeah, naught to one or yeah. percentages. Why complicate things? Yeah. Keep it incredibly simple because then it's very easy to see when the numbers get big. Yeah. So what you're interested in is ranking, not absolutes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And any way of Doing nice things with the numbers stops people from uh, ranking and makes them absolute. Because people suddenly stop worrying about the numbers. Yeah. They say, this is somewhere between 1 and 2. 1.5? 1. 1. 1. 1.75? Mm. No. Actually, no. It's a 1 or a 2, so we can throw it away. What we're worried about is the 3s, the 4s. Yeah. Thank you. As you may have noticed, I'm not cynical about this and I've never done any real world threat analysis, etc. Um, etc. Et I've never come up against real project teams, uh, real project managers, etc. Um, etc. Et None of that. So I do not know anything about this.